this is the second lesson in our series about faith, hope, and love. So as you can imagine, this one is going to be on hope. So let's go ahead and look at our key verse here. But now faith, hope, and love remain in these three, but the greatest of these is love. So one of the things, in case you didn't catch the last lesson that we were talking about, is how it seems as though this verse conveys a formula of these three primary Christian virtues. That in other words, when you're looking at this, it seems as though this is Paul reflecting to the Corinthian church a well-known phrase or that these things were often talked about together. Now, that's not something we know absolutely for a fact, but it seems as though based on the way that he's talking and the way that he presents this in 1 Corinthians 13, that that is something that he is conveying to them, something that you know might have been a popular saying that was familiar to the church at this time, something like that. And so... Because of that, I ask you last week to sort of keep these three questions in mind throughout this study, and I'll ask you to do that again this morning as well. So these are the same ones from last week. Why faith, hope, and love are the three primary virtues? Why is the, oh, or sorry, what is the significance of each individual virtue and these virtues as a group? And also, how do we cultivate these virtues in ourselves and in others? So Again, just kind of keep these in the back of your mind when we're going through this lesson, and I think that that really will help us get as much out of the material as possible. So you may also recall that last week I decided to start the lesson out with asking sort of the way that Jesus did when he said, okay, who do other people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? So we're going to reflect that formula here, and so I'll open up the the floor here in a second, but I ask, what do people say hope is? And if you look up the dictionary definition, you see that the feeling that is wanted can be had or events that will turn out for the best. Uh, Another definition, a particular instance of this feeling. Another one, grounds for this feeling in a particular instance. And the fourth one, a person or thing in which expectations are centered. And finally, at least on the noun portion of this, something that is hoped for. So that one I find a little weird because you're using the word to define the word. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, that's how they, that's how they did it. And then uh, on the verb form, to look forward with desire and reasonable confidence. To believe, desire, or trust. So now I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to y'all. When, when you think about hope, what does the world, the people outside of the church, generally speaking, when you use the word hope, what, what does that conjure up in their minds? Okay, a wish. A, a wish is a good way to describe it. They, they tend to think of it as just sort of a a uh, high-minded thought that you sort of want to happen, but it really doesn't go a lot deeper than that. Anything else? Okay, fantasy. That would be one way to describe it. Sort of a uh, fantastical view of something. Uh, Something that is unlikely to happen, but you'd kind of wish that it were in an ideal world. Okay, so that's a good one. Any other thoughts? It doesn't have to be. I'm just asking. Right, not a lot of objectiveness to that. It's not something that you have proof of, not something that you necessarily have good reason to think will happen. It's more just like, these are the things that I really desire to be true, whether or not I think that there's any reasonableness to them. So that, that would be one of the ways I think the world does see it. And when it comes to that, I do think that a lot of the world does kind of look at people with at least what Christians would call hope is is basically they only believe the things that Christianity teaches primarily because they want it to be true. And, you know, to be fair, there may actually be some people that claim Christianity that that is about as deep as their hope goes. They're, it's kind of like they're, they're hedging their bets. They kind of really hope God's out there, but they're not 100% sure on that. And so on the broader world, that may be a, a few ideas that I think are probably correct when you're asking what people say hope is. And uh, some of the things that I thought of, uncertain but un- but passionate wishing. So you're not really sure about it, but you're really, really, really hoping for it to be the case. Um, it's sort of like when you, when you were little, you got a present from grandma. You weren't sure what was in it, but you were really, really hoping it was something good and not clothes. So 
socks or something like that. Uh, longing for a utopian ideal. So this is on, on sort of the meta sense, but the general population, I would say, they, they kind of wish for this world where there's no problems and there's plenty of food and everything's taken care of and, and there's no anxiety or anything. And, and that's kind of what they think of hope as. That would be their greatest hope. A desire for rescue or deliverance. So we actually see this one a lot in popular PR and ad campaigns. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing because I actually think hope is a, a pretty good thing to use in conjunction with that. Uh, but we see, for example, if you, if you see in big pink letters the word hope, well, that's probably an ad for raising money for breast cancer. And, and again, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to market it that way. I actually kind of like the fact that they use that word. I think that that's a good application to that. But generally speaking, that's kind of what the world would think of when, when the word hope is conjured up. I remember uh, you used to have, especially back in the 90s, it was really big, the, the March for Hope or the Hope Ribbons, that kind of thing. And so that's probably what a lot of people in the world would associate with hope. Uh, as well, or, you know, charities, different uh, things to, to deal with things like poverty, hunger, that sort of thing. Alabama getting into a playoff of two losses. Lots of people hope for this. And uh, that's, sorry, not going to happen. So, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but you know, that, I just really threw that out there to demonstrate that that's the kind of thing that people really hope for more than the things that the Bible talks about us hoping for. And, uh, you know, I where it talks about hope really being something with expectation, I think that that really goes a lot more along the lines of what we're talking about when we're talking about Christian hope. So, for example, on the other side, you know, I wish Auburn were going to be really good next year. I don't expect them to be good next year. So there is like a difference between the expectation and, and uh, hoping and what John was talking about earlier, just something that's kind of a, a fanciful wish that you're throwing out there. And so th there is a distinction, especially in the scripture. So now that I've talked about that, what do you say hope is? Okay, confidence. So in other words, there's a difference in somebody that would, since I just used a sports analogy, steps onto a baseball field or a football field and is confident in their ability versus somebody who really wishes that they were good. I, I think that that's a good distinction to make, you know. I, I really wish that I could hit a 95-mile-per-hour fastball, but that's not going to happen. But somebody that actually does that professionally, they have a good bit of confidence that they can do that when they step up to the plate and face, face a good pitcher, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there, there is a difference there. That confidence is, is sort of a marker of hope, I would say. Anything else? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if that would be the hope itself, but I think it's certainly something that motivates the, the hope because that's something, right, I, I think that's kind of what you were getting at, that it keeps you going. You know, when you are down or there's a reason for you maybe to be discouraged in, in believing something, you continue to do so because you have that hope. So, yeah, excellent point. Okay, so the promises of God, something to hope for. Um, that would certainly be what our hope should be rooted in, for sure. Did I hear somebody else over here? Yeah, so what the Bible would call the peace that passes all understanding, that confidence gives you this kind of inner peace. So it's funny, um, I'm going to contrast this because I, I think it's a good point. Uh, in the last slide that I was talking about, a lot of people have this sort of utopian idea where they don't have to worry about money or food or, or gathering resources or anything like that anymore. That's kind of what they would hope for. Well, the difference is we actually have that. We just understand it doesn't come in this lifetime. And so, yeah, I think that that confidence that you're talking about that gives you that peace, you know, they would kind of want the world to be reconstructed so that they could have that peace. What the Christian is talking about is you reconstruct yourself in accordance with God's will, and then you have that peace regardless of what's going on in the world outside you, which I think is a, a much more realistic and more obtainable hope as well. So excellent point. All right, so we'll go ahead and get into the scripture. If you would go ahead and look at Romans 8, verses 18 through 21. Romans 8, 18 through 21. We'll actually cover verses through 25, but right now we're just going to look at these first couple of verses. And he states here, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the, eager awaiting, uh, for the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to the corruption into 
the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So again, I'm going to kind of open up the floor to you here. When he talks about it not being worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed unto us, why is he bringing that statement to the Roman church's attention? Right, so the situation at the church in Rome at the time is very different than the situation that we're having here. You know, regardless of what we may talk about with our religious liberties being trampled upon, and and that's a legitimate concern, it wasn't anything compared to what the Roman church was undergoing at the time. This is a church that for the past 10 years had been split in half because Jews were expelled from the city. I mean, just completely run an entire race of people out of the city itself and lost about half the church. Uh, So these are people that had experienced real persecution, and this is going to be in the amping up of Christian persecution in the era Romans is written. This is going to be right around the time of Nero. And so uh, people have already started persecuting the church by this time, and they have undergone real sacrifice to be able to continue to walk the path of a Christian. And so Paul is bringing this up in the sense that he's saying, whatever you are going through, which in the Romans' case, was 100% legitimate and was happening to them. He's saying it doesn't matter how bad it gets. It's still not going to be even worthy to be compared. So when he talks about it not being worthy to be compared, the thing that I think about is when you're undergoing a situation that is particularly difficult, that you're willing to endure it on your own terms because you're so anticipating what the result of that is going to be. Now, there's a hundred different analogies that I could come up with about this, but uh, essentially you're able to endure whatever it is because you know on the other side of that experience is something that is going to be worth everything that you're going through. You know, for for example, uh, if you've ever gone through something really difficult, uh, difficult academically, You know, that can be a very challenging, stressful process, but you're willing to endure it of your own free will because you believe that whatever is going to be on the other side is going to be at least better than the experience that you're going through or worth the experience that you're going through. Paul's saying that the gap between those two things when you're talking about Christianity is so wide that you really can't even compare the two. There's no comparison. It's not like you have to sit down and parse it out as like, okay, here's some pros, here's some cons. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, for what we know we are hoping for, you don't even have to enter the calculation process to know that what you're going to receive out of that is significantly better than everything you have to endure as a result of that. That's the kind of hope that he is talking about here with the Christian church. And I noticed also that in verse 19, there is an eager awaiting. So this is something that is very anticipated. This is something that they are looking forward to. And that is something that I think encourages people and helps them identify Christians as somebody different. Now, one example that I think of just off the top of my head is when you're looking at the martyrdom of Stephen, which we see in in the book of Acts, does that sound like somebody that wasn't eagerly awaiting meeting his Savior? I mean, this is a person that is being stoned to death and in the process is asking for forgiveness for them, first of all, and then seemingly looking forward to the reward that he's about to receive. That is not the typical reaction to a stoning. Not that I've seen too many of them, but you know what I'm saying. This is not the normal reaction of the average person. And so this eager awaiting that we're talking about, that's the kind of Christian hope that is being discussed here. And I really am curious as to why we don't see that quality more often by those who claim to be Christians. You know, and I'm I'm not talking necessarily about the church. I'm talking about the broader Christian community. However, I think that this is probably something that we could apply to the church as well. Why do you think that Christians don't have this attitude more often about this? Why do you think that they don't knowing that this is going to be their eternal reward, or at least, you know, believe that that's going to be the case, why do they not more often have this reaction to things like death? Because we we see Christians are, uh, I mean, seemingly, uh, there are a lot of Christians that have a lot of anxiety about that, and that's not an unreasonable thing. I'm just asking, why, why do you think we don't often see this attitude reflected in the Christian community? Okay, yeah, I think that that's part of it. They're still maybe on the fence a little bit. They're not 100% sure. 
Like, they think this is probably the case, but they're not assured of it. I think that that's a big part of it. You know, I remember a sermon that Brother Melvin Ote preached up here one time, and the analogy that he gave was the Titanic. Now, I know that it might not meet our definition of luxury today, but back then, I mean, there was a ridiculous amount of decadence going on on the Titanic, and he said, the thing that was so great about that is even the cheap seats, even the, the tickets where it wasn't necessarily that you were a super rich person or an elite, even the cheap seats on that boat were pretty good. And I think that sometimes, because we, we live in a modern world where a whole lot of things that past generations didn't have to worry about are there, maybe sometimes that's what happens to us, is that we get a little bit comfortable in this world, and we don't have to worry as much as previous generations did, and because of that, we get a little bit too attached to the world. I think that that's an excellent point. Interesting, so you're almost saying that the, the lack of persecution may be a contributing factor to that. The fact that we do have it a lot easier than previous generations of Christians is the reason that we're not necessarily hoping for something ahead because you don't have to hope for something as hard when what you have you know, is considered good, at least by worldly standards. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. So I think all of these are, are contributing factors. Um, but I, you know, I really love the fact that when you look in the New Testament, you see that the Christians that are being discussed here, they seem to have a anticipation. You know, we, we can read uh, about Paul. He says he's actually torn between wanting to remain and do the work of the church and then going on to be with the Savior. So, like, th there's actually a part of him that's almost looking forward to death. Uh, we see that all of the original apostles, except for John, actually died for their faith, and they, they did so willingly. We see that uh, in Acts 4, when Peter and John are confronted by the Jews and say they're telling them not to go out and preach about Jesus anymore, they say, basically, look, if, you, if you're if you going to kill us, kill us, but we're not going to stop. And so there is this eagerness, this almost anticipation of being with the Savior, with the hope that they, they have. And, you know, I really do think, and you kind of heard it in the comments that we discussed just a second ago, that maybe this is why... On average, even in the modern world, poorer people actually do tend to be more religious. I do think that there's an aspect of that. Now, we see scriptures all the time where it talks about it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, for example. I don't think that that means rich people can't go to heaven. I think that the Bible cuts against that. We see very uh, many wealthy or, or well-off people that are very faithful. But the point is there are more temptations for a person that has a good bit of means in the world. I think that that's true. And so because of that, you, you see a lot of the poor people, the people that were downtrodden, the people that maybe didn't have a lot to lose in this world, they were the ones that really figured out who Jesus was the earliest, didn't they? I mean, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, a lot of the prominent Jews, there were a lot of them that were converted at Pentecost that um, you know, might have had a, a pretty decent life, and maybe that's the reason they didn't really jump on to see who Jesus was until afterward. But beforehand... You saw an awful lot of, of poor people that sort of gravitated toward Jesus. Rich people too, not to say that there weren't some of those, but my point in all of that is if you feel as though there are things that you can kind of do for yourself, hope isn't something that you see as quite as appealing. For poor people, that's why they tend to gravitate towards that because they understand how much they rely on God. And I think that there's some truth in that as well. So let's go ahead and look at the rest of this passage in Romans 8, 22 through 25. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they already see for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor on this one as well, primarily just because I've never given birth. And so I really kind of need some help here, ladies. Uh, and yes, only the ladies, regardless of what the world tells you, you're, you're the ones that are going to be giving birth. So uh, for those of you that have done that, what is giving birth like? Why is this verse worded in the way that it is where he talks about the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Why is he using that as the metaphor here? Okay, so kind of what we were talking about in the previous passage then, where what's coming 
is so much greater that you're willing to endure that process, painful and seemingly taking forever as it is, to be able to get to the end result, which is getting being able to hold your baby in your arms and, and being able to have that baby for the rest of their life. And so, yeah, there's, there's sort of an analogy to that that is being presented here, that that's sort of like the hope that we're having. You know, when you're, you're pregnant, you're hoping for that baby to come. That's, that's part of uh, what happens in that process. So, yeah, a- a- excellent point. Uh, I think that it's interesting, though, because he couples these two metaphors together. He starts with the pains of childbirth and then moves into language for adoption. Now, I think that any of us can understand, even if we have not been involved in that process ourselves, why that is something that is eagerly awaited, which is what's being talked about here. You know, there there are several families here that have adopted or have been adopted or have, have, have some connection to that process. But what he's talking about here, you know, you think about somebody who is an orphan that doesn't have a family, how much they would eagerly await being able to be with a family. You know, if you've lived however long the, the child has been going on, five, eight, ten years, and you've been an orphan, and especially back in this time where there weren't all the resources that are available today, I mean, even today we can understand it, that it's more than just, okay, well, I have enough to eat and I have enough clothes and that kind of thing, which may or, you know may be true, but what's even more important here, what is being discussed, is that you get to go and be with your family. You get to have a family. You get to belong somewhere. And that's the kind of process that Paul is talking about here. This is the kind of hope that we have, that we're going to be welcomed into the family of God once this life is over. That's what he's talking about, this eager anticipation that he is discussing here. And I I do think, though, in verse 25, where he talks about the hope that we do not see, this kind of reminds me of the story of Thomas, honestly, where Thomas you know, says that he's not going to believe until he's actually placed his hands inside the nail print in his hand. And then, of course, when he does, he does believe. And then you remember what Jesus' response to him was. He says, Thomas, blessed are you who have believed because you have seen it, but blessed are those who have come after who believe yet have not seen. And so that's kind of what this verse reminds me, is that when you hope for something, you don't hope for something that you already see, you don't, you already have. You don't say, uh, you know, I, I really hope that I'd have the truck that I want if you already have the truck that you want. Like, that's not a thing you hope for if you've already got it. And so that's the thing that is being talked about here, that when we're talking about the eternal reward of heaven or, you know, the the hope that we are looking forward to, whatever that may be, that's something that we have to endure with perseverance and keep that hope alive because that's something that we don't see. And so there is an aspect of faith bound up inside that hope. We have been blessed by God and really trusted in this way. You know, I've often thought about, and I think every Christian has, how much you would want to have lived in the time where Jesus was actually physically here on earth. And and I do. I I really think about that on a pretty regular basis, how much it would be, uh, how great it would be to actually have got to known him in the physical standpoint in my life. But the thing is, we've been placed in a position of trust where God has put us in the time that we have now despite the fact that we don't have the actual person of Jesus standing right in front of us to see him. And I think that that denotes that God is saying that he trusts us to be able to come to these correct conclusions without having that in our lives. That we're able to have this hope despite the fact we've never actually seen him. And so that's a hope that is going to be anticipatory. And even the apostles who actually got to be with him on a regular basis, traveled with him for three years, even though they got to know Jesus himself, They still had not seen heaven. And so even their faith had an aspect of hope involved in it, even though they got to travel with the man on a daily basis. So let's go ahead and move on to 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, though the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So when we're looking at verse 3 here, why does he use the descriptor living? So when he's talking about a living hope, what does Peter mean by that? active. I think that that's part of it for sure. 
Things that are dead are not active, typically. That's the way that that works. So if it's a living hope, it is a hope that is continuing to do the things that living things would do. You know, it's, it's continuing to do things. It's animated, as George pointed out. Intentional hope. Okay, so uh, inanimate objects are not intentional. They have no intentions. Uh, dead things do not have intentions because they're dead. Living things do things for a reason. You know, when, when a, a dog goes to eat its food, it intends to do that because it understands that it's hungry. And so th there is an intentionality with that hope. It's something that you actively make choices on. So I, I do think that that's a good aspect of it. Yes. Okay, so if our hope is in Christ, and it's supposed to be, you could also look at it from a different aspect, not that the hope within us necessarily is living, because that's what we've been talking about so far, but looking at it from another angle, you could also see that if the hope that we have is Jesus, then our living hope is Jesus because Jesus continues to be alive. So yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Oh, okay, you were just agreeing. Okay, <laughs> I got gotcha. you. But yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so from both angles, I think you could look at this and say that the hope that we have is, is a living hope. And I think that when we're talking about this idea of a living hope, it's also something that is continual. You know, we, we were just talking about that. that This hope is something that continues to endure, where he talks about it uh, being something that we persevere to. So when we talk about a living hope, that is an enduring hope, a hope that continues regardless of the things that are lobbied against, or that are lobbed against it. You know, there are attacks on our hope. That happens if you're a Christian and you've been so for any amount of time, you know that there are attacks on your hope, both internal and external. And yet the hope continues to endure because it is alive. It continues. And, and another thing that living things do that I think we could sort of stretch this analogy out a little bit more is living things grow. You know, even if you've already been an adult for a while, you're continuing to grow. Your cells are constantly dividing. You have cells dividing inside your body right now. And so the, one of the things it is to be living is that you are continuing to grow and continuing to advance. And so if we have a Christian hope, a living hope, then it is a hope that not only continues and endures and just sustains itself, but also one that is continuing to grow as well. And so I think that that's an aspect of it as well. And when it talks about a living hope, I think it also, making that analogy back to um, what Brother Robert was just talking about, if you're talking about hope in the sense that it's Jesus, it's a living hope because it's been resurrected. You know, Jesus was once dead and now is alive, and now our hope can be alive in him as well. And so this idea that Jesus has been resurrected from death, that death no longer affects him, just as it will one day no longer affect us. So that's the kind of hope that we have, is that because our hope has been resurrected, that we too will be resurrected, and our hope reflects that resurrection, that it cannot be killed. And uh, I think that that's kind of what he's getting into in the bottom there, where he's talking about it being protected by the power of God. You know, Peter is talking to people that are living in constant uncertainty. If you remember, because this is part of Peter's introduction, the people that Peter is addressing in this letter are people that are Jews scattered amongst Asia Minor, scattered amongst the, the known world here that are not living in Jerusalem. They're not among the family of faith, at least as it would have been understood in the Old Testament. And what Peter is saying to them is that you have this living hope something that is constant, something that is there, something that you can be assured of. Don't put your faith in Jerusalem. Don't put your faith in your blood ties to Abraham, as important as that may have been to them at one time. He's saying that's not what your hope is. Your hope is a living hope because it is in a living God. And so because of that, regardless of what your external circumstances may be, your hope is something that should remain as a constant. You know, I remember talking to Dr. Parker, who was one of my favorite professors at Faulkner, and I took his class on resurrection, and we did a whole semester just on what the resurrection will be like, what heaven will be like, what does the Bible say about the afterlife, that kind of thing. And actually, if you remember, Giff did a whole uh, lesson series on this, I believe, last year, where he talked about that, and a lot of the stuff that he talked about was inspired by Dr. Parker's resurrection class. And I remember he said to me in that class, and I think this was only like the second or third class, he said something, he's like, I hope this doesn't offend people, but sometimes people get a little testy when I bring this up, but I think it's true. He says, in the churches of Christ, we have an extremely good uh, understanding of church, worship, what worship is to be like. We have a good idea of, of the scripture, the knowledge of the scripture, all of those things. We have a very bad, ecclesi uh, we have a, a very bad eschatology. 
And what he means by that is eschatology is just a fancy college word for uh, things relating to the end times and the resurrection. And I think that he actually had a legitimate point there. It seems like we don't talk about heaven a whole lot, to be honest. Uh, We don't talk about the things that we're hoping in, but that's what we're doing here. Isn't that something that should be talked about on a pretty regular basis? Because that's really the point of everything that we're doing. I'm not saying that what we we have is bad or that what we're talking about is something that is uh, something that we shouldn't be. I'm just saying that I kind of feel like we need to talk about heaven a little bit more because ultimately that's kind of the purpose of why we're here, isn't it? So that we get to eventually go on and have eternal life and, and be in the presence of God. And so maybe it would help us if we thought about this kind of hope that we have a little bit more often and talked about it with one another and the hope that we have a little bit more frequently. I just think that that's something that we might be able to work on and improve ourselves a little bit. So let's look at the second part of this passage in in verses 6 through 9. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, I think that this is interesting because he talks about hope being the proof of your faith. And so it's interesting that we our, our core verse talks about faith, hope, and love. And then in this verse, Peter actually connects hope to faith. You have to have the faith before you have the hope. That, that's part of the process. And he's saying that the hope that we have is a proof of faith. So when Hebrews 11, which we looked at last week, talks about faith being the things, uh, the evidence of things not seen, but the what assurance of things that are hoped for, So he's talking about this connection between these two things, hope and faith. You have to have the two of them together. And then he talks about hope being like gold. Well, I'm not exactly somebody that is an expert in metalworking, but I do know a little bit about the process. And I know that in order to purify rare earth metals, they have to undergo a purification process that is very lengthy and very extreme. And I think that the point that he's bringing up here is, how do you purify gold? Well, there's only one way, fire. You have to melt it down, you have to remove the impurities, and then you have to build it back up and mold it back together. And so if that is the case, then that means that our hope, in order to be precious and valuable like gold is, is it has to be melted down, it has to be purified so that it can be something that is useful. And that means that we're going to be enduring trials. Our hope, just like our faith, is going to be tested. And in order for it to be something that is valuable and useful to us, it has to go through that trial by fire. Notice also that there's a cause and effect language here, which I think is really interesting, where he talks about it being uh, distressed by various trials, and then the result is it being in praise. And then it says, uh, though you have not seen him, you love him. But obtaining this, this is the outcome of your faith. And so there's this relationship between faith and hope that, you know, you have faith and the result is hope and you have faith and the result is hope. And this is a theme that is repeated in this passage. And so, this again, there's this connection that he's making here. And then we look in verse 8. Um, essentially, what is being discussed here is you do not have to see him to place your hope in him. You know, it's interesting that we just went through and, and there was a comment a second ago about... Uh, being relate, hope being related to childbirth that mothers are willing to endure, they're willing to endure a great deal of pain if it means they get to be with their children afterward. And that's the same kind of thing that we should have as well, is that we're willing to endure a great deal of pain and suffering if it means eventually we get to be with our Christian family. That's the goal that we're ultimately lo- looking for, is that we have this hope that is going to be realized in the form of being with our family, just like childbirth. And so we don't have to see him just like a mother doesn't have to see the baby to have that hope and anticipation of, of him or her being in her life. And so I think that that's a fantastic analogy for this. So let's look quickly at, at Lamentation. Um, this is, again, uh, this is going to be the prophet Jeremiah mourning over the captivity that is being undergone by Israel. So 
uh, they're going through quite a, a great deal at this point. We're going to look at uh, chapter 3, verses 18, and we're going to go all the way through 24. He says here, My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say my strength has perished, and so has my hope from the Lord. Now remember, this is a man that is a prophet. God speaks to him directly. And he is so distraught by his surroundings and what is happening to him is that he is saying that he doesn't even have hope in the Lord. That he is so distressed by what Israel is enduring that his hope in God has gone. And then this is the result of that that we see in the next passage here. Uh-oh. My computer has frozen. Come on now. There we go. All right. So verses 19 through 24. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Truly my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to mind, therefore, I have hope in the Lord. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassion never fail. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. Now I find this wording to be really interesting, especially in verse 21. You notice what he says there. He doesn't say, but the Lord gave me a new revelation and it renewed my hope. It's not what happened. Jeremiah didn't get new revelation from God. He didn't get new information. It's like, oh, now that I have that, now I can really hope in God again. What happened? He recalled to his mind. So many times in our life, that's what hope actually is. It's not getting new revelation. It's not getting new info that we didn't know about God beforehand. I'm not saying that that can't be a good thing. We need to constantly be trying to, to learn and expand our knowledge of God. But that's not really what fuels the hope, according to Jeremiah. It's being reminded of the things that we already know. If we know the things that we had when we made the decision to put on Christ in baptism, then that's all we have to recall to renew our faith. So yes, Jeremiah is in a bad way. He's endured a lot and he is distraught over what has happened to Israel. But eventually what happened to him is he just remembered the things that he already knew about the Lord. He already knew that he was steadfast. He already knew that he was faithful. He already knew who God was. And when he reminded himself of that, then his hope in the Lord is restored. And so, so much of keeping our hope alive and maintaining our Christian hope is not getting new information. It's remembering the things that we already know. And when he says that the Lord is my portion, therefore I have hope in him, a person's portion means their rations, the food that they have. So ultimately what he's saying is, what I had in the Lord, that was sufficient, that was enough. Once I had that, I was sufficient in what I had. So uh, I did have one more passage in Ezekiel, but I'm going to uh, end in Second Corinthians, but I guess we'll have to go ahead and skip those. So really quickly... There is an absolute assurance in God's salvation. That is what the hope is. It is a certainty, something that we know for a fact to be true, that we have that affect our behavior and our outlook on life because of that. That is what hope ultimately does. And hope inspires righteousness as the natural result of that. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to see that. I, I'm perfectly fine with sending anybody the passages that I had if you uh, want to look up those later. But one of the things that is discussed in those is that hope inspires people to live righteously, and righteousness is the natural and inevitable result of a person that has hope in God. And then also, this is the big thing and, and something that I hate that we didn't get a chance to get more into, but ultimately, hope must be based in truth. Because one of the things that the Bible says over and over again is people keep putting false hope in things. If hope is not based in truth, then it is a false hope. Whether it was idols, whether it was yourself, whether it was your armies, or, or whatever else in this world you were hoping in, if your hope is in anything that is not God, it is a false hope. Because eventually, whatever it is you're hoping in is going to let you down unless the thing you're hoping in ultimately is God. You have to have truth in order to have a hope that is actually going to be worth something. So that's all I had this morning. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.